Hi, HR Nation. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives in the world's leading global brands. I'm so excited for today's episode. Um, someone I've been wanting to have on the show for a very long time. We're finally making it happen. I'm joined by Dr. Keith Keating, Senior Vice President <laughs> and Chief Learning Officer at Archwell. Welcome to the show. How are you? I am doing really good. I cannot complain. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. Finally. Yeah. So last time we spoke, you wasn't a doctor, Keith Keaton. <laughs> now you're now you're a doctor. So we'll just start there. Tell everyone about that. Uh, yeah, I did a thing, and now I'm a doctor. I did a thing. Um, so I finished. <laughs> so I last time we spoke, by the way, you was like, oh, college dropout, you know, <laughs> and now you're a doctor, Keith Keaton. So we've come a long way yeah. since the last phone call. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been a long journey, but uh, it's beautiful to be on this this side of it, and I couldn't be prouder of myself, honestly. Yeah, well, let's start from the beginning then, because it will provide a bit of context for everyone. Yeah. Tell everyone a little bit more about you personally and your journey to where we are now. So I think it's important to understand where I came from from an educational perspective. So I grew up overseas. Uh, my father was in the military, and so my formative years were in Europe. And that gave me, I think, a bit of an advantageous educational um, introduction rather than in the U.S. And so when I came to the U.S. when I was 12 or 13, I was already ahead of some some of my classmates in some areas, and I was behind in others. For example, U.S. history. We didn't really study that in Europe. We studied European or global history. And so within the first year or so, I had teachers who were praising me for being above average and wanting to put me into um, advanced classes. And then I had other teachers who were telling my parents that I needed to be held back and that I potentially had a learning disability. And so my parents so were confusing. fairly confused. On one hand, I'm, I'm being praised. On the other hand, I'm being labeled at, with a learning disability. And so that started my struggles with education. And by the time I was 15, I had been, I, I was bullied a lot in school because I was the new person. We were moving every year. Um, I was bullied because uh, my, my grades and some of them were, were bad. Some of them were really good. I was very confused, my parents were confused, and so eventually I dropped out of high school uh, when I was 15, and I ended up getting what's called your GED, uh, General Education Diploma. It's basically a test that says you have the basic fundamentals of what you need to, to have a, a high school equivalency exam. And when I did that, um, my family, the educators, um, society in general told me that I would only have a life destined for fast food, as if there's something wrong with that, first of all. There's yeah, not. Exactly, yeah. uh, but but they, they put me in this box where if you drop out, you're, you're never going to amount to anything. And so for several years, that was my mentality, and that's what I believed until um, – I just realized one day I wanted to be something else. I wanted I, I wanted something more, and I and I had no idea what that was or or how I would even get there. And that really started my path to learning and development uh, because I had to first of all learn myself. I had to teach myself the skills that I needed to do something else. And this was many years before we started talking about the skill deficit or skills economy. And so from my, my personal experience, I was able to, to learn very early on the importance of skill and skill building and, and learning and development. So long story short, that's, that's been my journey. That was the start of my journey to the path of, of where I am today. And, and for me, what makes it even more powerful is that I am a high school dropout who is now a doctor from a prestigious university in North America. It's amazing, and uh, I feel like it's quite you're quite lucky though, because you you and I'll, and I'll share kind of I had a similar story and journey, where um you you came out of that looking at it the other way of like where instead of letting hearing what your teachers said, what your parents said, make you think, well, I can never do this, so I'm just gonna accept that fast food. You know, again, nothing <laughs> wrong with that. 
is my destiny. And many people do, right? They're told by guidance counselors and teachers, et cetera, that, that you're this. And, this, and then subconsciously you convince yourself that that's what defines who you are. Whereas you were like, actually, no, <laughs> I'm going to go again. That would that actually use that as fuel. Uh, and, and I did the same thing because when I was, I didn't learn how to read until I was like 13. And I, I thought like, I used to, do, I used to get, um, I used to, I used to, I don't even know what they were called, but I used to have to stay after school um, and do English and, and maths. It was like torture basically. So you said every school's over, but I have to stay, <laughs> stay here and do more of the things that I hate. But again, at the same time as kind of your story, in 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 um sort of um graphics or art class or and you know, I excelled. You asked me to draw a perfect portrait of someone, I can do it. You asked me to paint something, I can do it. You asked me to sculpt something, I can do it. You asked me to do some sports, excelled. But so I had and, and I remember sitting in a classroom again with lich I remember the name of the teacher. This is how much it scarred me. Miss Treadwell. All, all these years, because I remember it like that, that's how long, even though I was like 13 years old, I remember it because I remember being so upset. To tell my mum that I had learning difficulties and, and X, Y, and Z. And, and I convinced myself for so long that I could never do English, maths, et cetera, et cetera. Like, because I heard these people say it, so it must be true. My parents says it and my teacher says it, that it must be true, right? For so many years, I, you know, I held myself back. Uh, and uh, excelled in all those things still. But there was a moment where I realized that the same principle applies to how I, I'm really bad at doing this particular sport. It's this, it, it, you start off terrible <laughs> and then there's a process of learning and growth that happens along the way. And I was like, maybe I don't have these difficulties. Maybe it was just, I didn't want to do it. Maybe as a kid, I just mm -hmm. didn't enjoy it. And, I, and then when I looked at it from a new perspective, all of a sudden, I could do all of those things and it was very easy and it came natural and I was like, oh, okay, cool. I still don't enjoy it as much as the creative elements. And uh, even now, in, even in my current job, this is why I do this show. I love creating new ideas and creating content, audio, video, you know, it kind of makes sense <laughs> kind of in a way, the digital version. But um, I think that's super important because I've still got friends and family that are still held back, back by those unfound beliefs or what they've been told and, um, me, myself and uh, both of us went against that and, and actually used it as fuel to drive our careers and you know what 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 a, a story that you're now a doctor and you're a chief learning officer of all things <laughs> to do that um, as well you know one of the one of the things that, that um to, to your point that i've i've struggled with and i'm very passionate about is breaking these ideas of, of boxes that we have to put ourselves in boxes uh, you know, one way that we do that is job titles. I'm a big advocate for not focusing on job titles. Someone once told me what follows the words I am will follow you. Mm. And so I don't like to, to focus on, on job titles or categories or um, feeling that we have to fit inside of these specific boxes. You know, if you look at, at me, for example, um, there's no reason that I should be uh, a chief learning officer by society standpoint, or be a doctor from University of Pennsylvania by society standpoint. And and I think that part of it is that um, I hid for so long. I didn't want to tell people. You know, I I didn't actually say that I was a high school dropout until about nine months ago. I had forgotten. I've lied about it for so many oh years my God, really? that it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't even a part of my story because it, I've never said it to anybody. And then it, when I started to really think back to my story and, and my struggle with learning, cause I've struggled my entire life with it, which is what I think why I'm so passionate about it is because now I understand it. And I, and, and I've gone from hating school and hating education because it just, it was so hard for me that now I love it and I want other people to love it because it is so powerful. It truly unlocks our potential. There is nothing that can stop us if we understand how to learn and how to develop. And it's not about a teacher. It's not about a, a university. It's not about your organization. It is about you. Every one of us, we need to own our responsibility to being lifelong learners. And we, you and I, and, and learning development practitioners, we're curators, we're creators, we'll, we'll help create and, and 
put you on that path, but you've got to take that ownership. And now that I understand that and I know how learning and development works, I want everyone to understand and, and to be able to, to value and, and really take control over their future. There's a lot of these, these buzz phrases about future proofing, which I'm not a fan of. I don't believe we can future proof, but we can future prepare and we can future ready. And the way that we do that is through learning and development. Yeah. Uh, and, and I felt that same way for a long time as well, by the way, because um, I didn't go to university and I basically didn't, I got halfway through college because we do college and university and I didn't even turn up for half of the exams at the end. So basically got nothing went <laughs> to show for the, the few years that I was there. Uh, and, and I was quite embarrassed about that for a while. Um, but what I realized uh, when I went into my first job, which was a sales job, is that I remember that kind of like, oh, no, everyone here has got a degree and uh, the job required a degree. But I got and I ended up getting the job anyway because I said I work for free. And and if you think I'm good, then you can hire me because they wouldn't hire me because I didn't have a degree. So that was my way in. I was like, I'll do it for free because <laughs> I don't have these, these this degree that you want. And I realized when we got in that it didn't matter what degree everyone had. We all had the same tools. We both, we all had phones. We all had the same training. We had the same amount of time in the day and we all had access to the internet. So I was like, I was like, oh, so it's a level playing field right now. It doesn't matter that you've got, you went to university. It doesn't mean anything. And that was the moment where I did, I did share that, oh, I don't have a degree. Cause I was like, it really doesn't matter. It's, same, it's the same way when I played sports and we, you know, played hockey or any sport. It didn't matter if you were a rich kid and I was a poor kid. When we step on the ice, is a, is a level playing field. <laughs> so I was like, so, all, so again, that was another insecurity of being poor. But so I kind of had those comparisons and I realized, oh, wow, it doesn't really matter. And I realized that for the first time um, in, in that job that learning was my superpower. And uh, so, and it, I, I said this so many times on the show, but again, like I still remember my little sticky note that said, the more you learn, the more you earn. <laughs> that I used to look every day and I literally took that so serious <laughs> and i'd never wanted to mm -hmm. read i was ne i'd never been so excited about reading or actually in my case listening to au audiobooks in my life because i was like if i listen to this can you do this then next day i'll go and apply it immediately on the phone in my next call and then close the deal and then i can see the the correlation between the learning the growth and the money literally <laughs> me walking into my apartment that i bought i was like that's a direct correlation to this learning that I did here, it was like, I could measure it literally by the pound <laughs> of, of being able to do it. Sales is actually quite an easy one to measure uh, in, in that sense um, as well. So I completely with you on on, on that part. It's uh, And the I am thing, by the way, I, I don't do it so much now, but when I was in sales, I used to get fall to sleep with I am sales, I am um, uh, playlists, like a five hour playlist. I am going to close the deal. I am successful. I am a millionaire. I am. And I used to sleep with headphones <laughs> in. That's how serious I took that I am. And uh, even to the point where people that know me, I'll say I'm good at everything. Not because I'm trying to be arrogant, but I'm trying to con constantly convince my subconscious mind that I am good at everything. Mm -hmm. And I am good at everything because I will learn. I'm not when I start, but there's a perception that I am good at everything because no one sees the failures. They just see the success uh, along the way. So... That's, that's an important well, you know, I love that you talk about the, no one sees the failures is that that's or part of the reason why I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. kind of shouting right now that I am a high school dropout is because when we live in an Instagram world right now, and it's, it's these beautiful filtered pictures that are showing this reality of, of a single moment, but we don't understand the journey that went behind that moment to get there. And so we are, pining for that one Instagram moment, not realizing all of the hard work that went in. And so you talk about a, a level playing field. That was one of the reasons why I did the doctorate program is that I wanted to be able to come out on the other end and in a way be a, a, a voice or an example that what society says equals doctor from an Ivy League university isn't necessarily the case. And that if I can do it, being a high school dropout, not coming from money, struggling with learning and development uh, my entire life, then so can other people. Because I'm not smart. I, you know, I, I am, my, my superpower is problem solving. 
I'll figure out how to get something done. But that's also what learning is, is that you don't know something, but you learn it, you, you figure out what it is, and then now you have that new information, that new knowledge, you know how to move forward. And so for me, um, I just hope that others can at least take away that what has defined us in the past doesn't need to define us for the future. And learning to me is, is the answer. Never stop learning because that's what's going to create these future opportunities for you. Yeah. And that's up to us each individually. Mm -hmm. I remember um, coming home to my mom because she's a single parent, four kids, we had no money. And when I start, started doing relatively well in sales, and I knew that the model that I, and what I had learned, whether it was objection handling or, you know, closing techniques or whatever it may be. And I remember coming home to mom and saying, we're never going to be poor again. She was like, what do you mean? Because I was like, I've just learned a skill called sales and I'll never, ever be poor. <laughs> because no matter what, no matter where I go, whatever company, whatever product, anything, and I just remember just having that thought to myself of like on the way home, I was like, I'm always gonna be have, have earn very good money because I'm there's always something that needs to be sold. It doesn't doesn't even matter if there's a recession, they still need people to sell. So so I remember just like that. It felt so I was so like the relief of like because obviously we grew up with single parent with four kids had nothing, and it's like yes, it's stressful sometimes. It is a hard job, but like I'll never have to worry about not having money ever. Like, but that feeling that you have is what everyone can feel who understands the power of learning. Because for me, that, that similar feeling was once I figured out I was a problem solver, I'm never going to be out of a job Yeah. because there are yeah. problems all over the world. <laughs> yeah. I know no matter what's happening in the world, I will have a job. And that's what I want every person to feel is that security about their future. And we look at workforce of the future. We look at, uh, automation and you know before COVID it was the threat that we're going to lose millions of jobs to robots mm -hmm. yeah. and all, you know all this other stuff but if you understand how to learn you'll have a job it's true you'll have a future I was also trying to say to my wife as well she's been in the same job for seven years and she's struggling of what do I do what do I do what do I do and you know um this job only takes so far she didn't even think it didn't the thought in, uh, didn't even enter her mind that she could learn a new skill at this age like she was completely, and it, it kind of, because I'm always so open-minded to learning new things, like random mm -hmm. things, actually, like nothing to do with what we do, <laughs> with what I do. And similar with uh, a lot of the team, like they have different hobbies outside. I was like, but she was looking at it only through that lens of her current skill that she has. I was like, what about this? And she's like, no, mm -hmm. but I can't do that. I'm like, well, wh why not? <laughs> like, go and learn it. She's like, yeah, but, and then she's, you know, she almost didn't have a, I, I, an excuse um but i was like do whatever you want like we, we why why do you think because we, we get older box. yeah we put us why do you think the older we get the more of a, the smaller that box gets it seems like because you know I, I, mm -hmm. I speak to my you no know, my daughter is only three years old you see like the sponge where they're like everything's an option at that age there's no there's, there's no box <laughs> at that point and then it feels like the older we get the smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller the box gets yeah we, there, there's this quote that's attributed to Alvin Toffler, who he actually, he never said this quote, but it is attributed to him. He supposedly said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And to your point, you know, the, the, we get this idea of skills and, and, and the, the job title that we have, but we have so many transferable skills that are applicable to so many other industries and jobs, but we don't give ourselves that permission because we tend to look at a job title and, oh, I've never had this job title, so I can't do that job. It's just a job title. I mean, if you look at the skills, so, and that's what I learned really early on when I did transition out of fast food was I found this other job and it was a trainer. And I was, I think, 17 years old. And I looked at the skills that they required and then I looked at, the skills that I had, and I literally lined them up to do a one for one. So I hadn't had the job title of trainer, but I had communication skills. I understood Microsoft Office. I understood how to work with people. 
And so it's just changing the story to, to look at our experience, regardless of the job title and how it matches the skills that that job needs. And then if there is a deficit, then you do a, a stretch assignment or you start researching and reading about those other skills because unless they're technical or really hard skills, chances are you probably have some of those as well. Mm -hmm. So you, you can think about then from that perspective, how much untapped talent that already exists in organizations um, as well. How, how are you looking at that for, at the lens in, in, for, in your own company that you're in now? How are you, how are you addressing that? Everything I'm saying here is the exact same thing I say to my team and the talent in the company. It's, A, don't define yourself by a job title. If there's a job posting and you're interested in it, you think you have some skills, apply for it. If you're not sure where to go from a career perspective, I'll have a conversation with anyone in the organization to take a look at wh where they want to go and, and what they might be able to do to get there. Um, we're heavily focusing on, of course, uh, skill development, talent development, the same, the same as everyone else. But for me, I'm very conscious about not keeping people in their boxes and creating opportunities. How do you, you mentioned obviously your own process then um, of learning. Do you have a specific process? How do you address your own skill gaps? Is there like, do you have a, like a mental model that you work through or you feel like you've been just doing it so long that you just jump straight in the deep end <laughs> as well? Uh, I think my model is not following a model. It's probably a little <laughs> bit different every day, yeah. whether it's a checklist. You know, I love the checklist manifesto. It's probably my, my go-to is I'll think of something, write it down on a checklist so that I see it come back and I can mark it off to know that I've, I've accomplished something. Um, the, the one piece of material that I would recommend, and I have no association with this book, but it's called Make It Stick, The Science of Learning. Uh, I have used this as a book club book for each organization I'm with. My current new team is we're getting ready to start it as well. That is the, the manifesto that I think every learning and development practitioner should read. So if you haven't read it, definitely check it out. It really reinforces the importance of spatial learning, of short-term versus long-term memory, how to make sure that, that learning sticks rather than just memorizing uh, to pass a test or memorizing the content in your short-term memory and for me it's a it's a tool that i've used to help define learning strategies for organizations mm -hmm. now, I've, I've heard that book so many times but not read it all so i'm, I'm probably gonna I, I talk about how learning six i realized for years i was reading books and i just could never retain it and then i switched to audiobooks and i realized straight away that i'm retaining so much more information but for mm -hmm. so I found it like painful to read a book and people are like, what do you mean? Don't you love a book, the feeling, getting into it? I was like, no, I find it really, really hard. And then I, I realized watching videos and listening was my way of learning um, for it. So I'll, I'll, I'll listen to the audiobook <laughs> a version of it. I'm the same. I can't, I cannot read either. It to, I, I can physically read, but I don't comprehend it. And yes. so I'll read a whole page and then I stop it's and I'm like, what did I just read? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. And then I have to go back and read it again. <laughs> yeah, it was so bad that what I used to do when I used to get given my scripts, uh, my sales scripts, it was like a five page binder, right? My All my sales stuff. So what I used to do, um, which was, so it may sound strange to people listening, but I'm just going to say it anyway. What I used to write it out. So I used to, get pieces of paper and write it out. So I'd read it, write it and listen to myself saying it. So I was using every single sentence. So I'm physically writing it down. I'm saying it out loud whilst I'm writing it down. I'm reading it. And then I would record it as an MP3 and listen to it on the way to work every day. Myself saying the script and then it stuck. Like, <laughs> and I was like, cause I didn't know what was working. So I was like, let me do everything. So, so I was like, one of the senses is, is gonna is gonna is gonna pick it up. So, and within a few weeks of listening to it, I could just had it down. Like I was like, I know this word for word, but reading it was just painful to, to be able to do it. So that's how I tricked myself into doing that. But it's such an innovative approach that you know you you're figuring out what what works best for you, not what uh, an education system says or what you've read. And I think that's that's the same with most of us is that there are there are nuances 
to how we learn. What works for me may not work for you and, and vice versa. So it's just exploring and figuring out what works. Mm -hmm. What do you think the main reason, like this frustration I get all the time with friends, family, even in employees about like investing in their learning, this sort of box we put ourselves in. What do you think the biggest challenge is for people to get out of it? Like what is it that, what is that sort of thing that's just stopping people from taking that step? That I think uh, one is the, the difference between the word training and learning. I'm not a big fan of the word training. I'm trying to help my team realize that we're not a training organization. We're a learning and development organization. And there's a difference. Training tends to be something that starts and stops. You know, if I say, hey, Chris, you're going to go to a training today. Something that's done to you as well, uh, right? It's something that's put on you. Yeah. Like it's <laughs> yes. like, you got to do this compliance training or you got to do this thing. Like, yeah, it's got a, so it's the brand as well, isn't it? It hasn't got a great brand <laughs> around the yep. word itself. Yeah. Rather than something that's personal that you get to own and control the way that works for you. Like you just gave a great example about recording yourself, listening back, reading, writing. You, you had this package of what works for you. I, uh, my, my approach is different, but each of us has a unique learning style that works for us. And so, A, it's giving ourselves permission that we can learn however works best for us, not what somebody else is dictating to us. And I think the other is, is just integrating it into your life, making it part of your, your day. The reality is, hopefully, we are all learning every day, whether it just be a five second, you know, you learn something from a commercial, you've heard something on the news, you read something in the newspaper, but you don't think about that as learning. I mean, our, our devices are upgrading all of the time. I, you know, every four or five days, I have to learn something new about an app that I have, or you know, your iOS updates every six months. You're like, okay, where did this icon go? That's an example of unlearning and relearning something. So it's, I think that the challenge is trying to take a step back that learning has to be something formal, structured, complicated, and giving yourself permission, even if it's five minutes a day, just pick up something new that you don't understand. Read it, watch it, listen to it, and just accept and take that five minute little nugget as that's your, 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 your little piece of learning for the day. Uh, so the answer to your question is I think it's giving ourselves permission that learning doesn't have to be complicated, doesn't have to be done to us, doesn't have to be formalized, and making it part of our everyday life and culture, which it actually is, but acknowledging it and celebrating that. Yeah, no, you're right. It is a, it's a, I feel like it is a state of mind. Uh, as well like I, I I can't stand I I get bored when I'm not learning something new super bored like uh, I was talking to Whitney Johnson who's sort of a best-selling author a LinkedIn influencer and uh, she, was talking to me, she, was telling, she was talking she was explaining to me the science behind why you get to she, she talks about the s-curve of learning and uh, she was talking about why I was like why do when I get really good at something I'd stop doing it and she's like well in your brain you're not getting that dopamine hit anymore because uh, along as you start seeing that you yourself progress you get like those dopamine hits and you can see the progress but when you get to a sort of certain level of mastery you get bored because you're no longer seeing the progression and then you go off because my friends mm -hmm. and family are like why do you never stick to one thing chris <laughs> you always do another thing another thing and i never knew why i was like why don't i just stick to these things that i'm very good at but i get bored of them um as well but i think most people oh, why can't you be celebrated for doing all of those things you know it's just a great example of someone trying to put you back in a box i'd rather be a jack of all trades than a master of one or none which is actually which is which is what people people normally use that you know quote the opposite way around right right so, so you've just flipped that yeah. you've just flipped that on his head which i completely agree with because i'm like i've got so many different sets of skills now that i don't ever feel that i'm going to be out of a job <laughs> in anything i'm like <laughs> that's so powerful i mean that that is the greatest gift that you could give yourself or anybody else and that's why i love our industries because it it has the potential to be unstoppable if people will let us do what it is that we are trying to do and that is help people to learn and grow and develop and i think that um you know the one thing you asked about why aren't we learning more uh, learning is not easy. It's hard. Like I know what I'm learning because my brain hurts <laughs> yes. and my initial reaction is like, I want to stop because this is not, but easy. you know, but and you I know, at that, that point, that's the, that's when you feel that, right. That's when you go, I should go towards that. 
that's how I look at it now. When I start feeling that that feeling you described, sorry to interrupt you, that's when I'm like, keep going that way. Whereas in the past, I used to run the opposite direction <laughs> away from it. Whereas now I'm like, oh, it feels painful. It's hard. Oh, and then I know that that's where yeah. the, the magic is. It doesn't feel that good <laughs> at the time, but. Yeah. But, and, but our, our society, I think, is so much based on instant gratification at this point. If we oh, want it yeah, now. It's like I want, you know, if this, is, if this feels hard, I don't want to do it. And so, and that's where I think our, our, our devices really um, hinder us because when I'm learning something and it starts to hurt, I immediately pick up my phone and I'm like, well, let me just check, yeah, you know, these yeah. two apps yeah, to give myself a break. It's, it's so and true. <laughs> what, what could have taken 10 minutes is yeah. now an hour and a half because it's like, it hurts, let me break. It hurts, let me take a break. It hurts, take a break. It's so true. I got I just some reason I just had this random uh, memory come into my mind and I'll share it because it, it, it does feel relevant. When I, when I used to, uh, um, when I was in college in the, in the winter, I used to do ice skating lessons. So they used to do like pop-up ice rinks. And um, I used to do the, um, like private lessons. So if you wanted to pay extra for your kid to learn how to skate, uh, just for the hour while they were there, I would do it. And I remember this parent like coming up to me, like obviously they gave their, their kid uh, was like maybe like seven and I got an hour skate lesson and they like shook my hand and gave me extra money in like a cash in hand, like, it was like a drug deal. It was a bit weird. And they were like, basically give my my son more attention. Types it like indirectly. And I was like, this is weird. But I was like, all right, fine. Took the money. But I remember when I got back and, and they were so disappointed that their son hadn't learned how to ice skate. So like, like all of a sudden within one hour <laughs> that they expected their kid to be ice skating perfectly. And they were like, oh, why didn't, you know, he, he didn't see much improvement. I was like, within an hour. It's like, to your point, like, mm -hmm. you're not gonna to, it took me like six months how to learn how to skate to a decent level. And you're asking, you, you expect your child and the child also was upset and the parent was upset. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's not good because if the expectation that you're putting on your, 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 your young son is that he or she should learn in an hour how to skate, that's not going to set them up for success. I was like, this is not, even back then I was like, this is not good. I remember seeing them leave being like, that parent is really overbearing on that kid, expecting them to learn to skate in one hour. And now they're a disappointment as well. Sorry, that just memory just came back uh, randomly in my head. I was like, that's crazy to to expect that. Um, and that's why I say, um, I said earlier about my superpower being is learning, but I, what actually, I don't actually say that. So I actually have a, a set of, um, um, did I do my best to, lines that I say every day and I complete it. It's like 20 things as part of my coaching. I'd say, did I do my best to, and one of them is, did I do my best to practice my superpower of resilience? So I don't call it learning. And the reason I call it resilience is it's the resilience to keep going when it gets tough. So those moments that you just mentioned where you're like, oh, or, or literally physically, when I skateboarded and fell over and smashed my head on the floor, <laughs> I still would get up and it's so not just mentally, but physically hurt, you know, for the sport. So resilience for me is, is a superpower I try and practice. And that is where you can push through those moments of where you want to give up. The moments where you don't, you don't, you don't want to do it, but you do it anyway, even though you don't feel like it, that's where really the real. And then, and now once you recognize that in that moment, you consciously are aware that you're in that moment, if that makes sense. It's almost like stepping outside your own body mm -hmm. and seeing yourself and being like, I feel like crap right now. I don't want to do it. Can't be bothered to do it. You think of all the reasons why you shouldn't do it, but you still do it. I think that's really where the magic, like real growth happens in those moments, but it doesn't feel good. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. You know, I, um, halfway through the doctoral program, I started changing some of my mail so that it said Dr. Keating, so that when it would arrive, you know, some bills or whatever, I would see it and it would remind me why I'm doing this. Oh, so, so many times. It's a great idea. It was so hard. I wanted to give up. Uh, so I've got colleagues who are still in the program. And I said, right now, get out a post-it note and write, write doctor and your last name and put it around so that you're visually reminding yourself, this is what I'm, what I'm working towards here. Yeah. One of the CHROs I spoke to recently had a process where like, Every, every morning they get up and open their wardrobe inside the doors of the wardrobe was all of the things similar 
examples of things they wanted to mm. achieve or a vision board. A vision board, but in the wardrobe. So like literally every day getting dressed. It was like <laughs> boom, you're just greeted. But it was all it was all from the frame, like you said, as if they'd already achieved it. You know? Yeah. Uh, so everything was referenced like like your like your example of doctors. So like they're already successful, they've already got that job title, they've already got that promotion, they've already got that, whatever it was, personal, business, it was all in there as if it had already happened and that's super powerful to see that every single morning but what i like about the the way you're explaining it is some people make vision boards and they leave it up on their wall but then it just becomes part of the background you know you like you know it's there but the way that you described it in the wardrobe is i'm see you know i'm waking up and i don't see it and then i open it and then boom i'm yes. reminded visually so it's a forced reminder exactly because i was just kind of just float by it that's that that's why i thought it was yeah. really powerful right because you're you're, you're almost opening up mm -hmm. to it every day because it was just in your house somewhere. You just kind of probably after after a while, just it will just fade into the background. Yep. Um, we had one on our sales floor, like um, a vision board, and um, everyone, every so you could see like you know exactly what AJ is working towards, and I could see his vision board. Like I know he wants this, and he had sort of short term ones, sort of week, uh, monthly, quarterly, and yearly. And that was so cool. Like, cause even if you didn't know the employee, you could walk over and you could see the vision board and be like, oh, AJ, like, and sometimes it was silly. Like it, for one of his ones and AJ, I, hope, I don't know if you're listening to this, but he was like, he wants a new pair of Jordans. And that was his monthly goal, right? To get this really expensive, you know, one of 20 pairs of, <laughs> pair of Jordans that was super expensive. And then the other one was a house. And um, it's funny how they work because years later after I had my one up, when we bought my apartment and I kind of found the old pictures because it was actually physically printed out, it looked exactly the same as my apartment, the layout. Mm. And that was freaked me out a little bit. I was like, oh my God, I was like, look at this. It was the ex almost exactly the same layout of the kitchen and everything. And I'd forgotten all about it, but I felt like it was so deeply, by the way, it was a third, third apartment we saw, just third. And I was like, this is the one. And I didn't know, I was like, no, this is the one. And my wife was like, we've only looked at three. I was like, no. <laughs> it's like this is the one and i think that's what it was i feel like it was ingrained subconsciously in my mind that like i don't know why but mm -hmm. there's something about this and my only question after that was what was the internet speed <laughs> that's it how fast is the internet yeah. connection <laughs> that was genuinely my only questions like is that all you care about i was like yeah i need fast internet that's about it um it's my priorities <laughs> at the time um as well um how does I had it something similar i found on, uh a a, a CV that I had created when I was 18 and I found it about 15 years later and I had done everything no way. that I put on that CV that I was going to do. That's so cool. A self-fulfilling prophecy is so powerful. I remember when the, was it called the secret? No, it's, d um, yeah, dude, I took that serious. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I, I you know, they talk about the universe. I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not a religious person, but I definitely believe that if you, what you project out there, you get back. And more so like mm -hmm. your self-talk, because I, I struggled with that for a long time. Like my self-talk was super negative, uh, which is why I started doing the whole I am playlists. I've got multiple playlists. And so what, some of the playlists were just like, I am, uh, I, I feel great. Like some of them were just from a well-being perspective of just, positive because i because i used to suffer from i still suffer from anxiety and panic attacks and i would have this really negative self-talk of i have anxiety or this is going to scare me and i'd say it so over so many times it compounds right and then you believe it you sort of embedded in your subconscious mind so that was a hard one to constantly do so i was like well well even while i'm asleep let me train my mind <laughs> to, to mm -hmm. and trust me i would wake up and feel so much better because all your your subconscious mind is is still awake while you're asleep, which is why sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night when you hear a sound. <laughs> it's still alert there. So if you're just feeding that positive information in there, even if it's not even true, your your subconscious mm -hmm. mind doesn't know the difference between a, a real and uh, something that's made up. There's no difference, and that's something when I learned that I was like, wow, that's fascinating that your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference. If you think and act and say and do things that if you are that, it will then produce outcomes of that. Like it, it, it does work. Then, 
That's where politics came from. <laughs> we won't go there. No, no it, went, it, went, it, went, it went the other way. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. Yeah. But it, it, it is important. And um, how, by the way, this is your first CLO role, right? How, how has it been? I'd like, congratulations on that too, right? Since we last spoke as well. Uh, it it feels right. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I said to uh, my boss last week, it's one of the first times in my life that I'm in the right place doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And it's such a peaceful feeling. Uh, and it's not, it's not the job title per se, but granted the job title was on my vision board. So I love that, you know, that I, that I have that, but it's more about the team, the mission, the vision. Um, so my goal at, at Archwell, our goal as a team is to be the best in class learning organization. Now, I've worked with a lot of Fortune 500 organizations around the world. I'm going to probably offend some people that I may have worked with. But when I think of where I've worked, there's not an organization that I want to be like. There are organizations that I've learned from, and I've learned what not to do. And so that has helped build my experience to know, well, we don't want to do this, we don't want to do that. And there are a few things that maybe we do want to replicate but overall, when I think about global organizations, there's not one L&D group that jumps out where I would say, that's what I want to be like. And so when I start talking with R12, I said, my vision is in three years, I want to be that organization where we are so successful that we are doing learning right, that others want to replicate what we're doing and how we're doing it. I want to be able to go back to University of Pennsylvania and teach a course about how we're teaching our talent at Archwell. So at Archwell, what we're doing is we're hiring raw talent around the world, uh, mostly offshore, that have no experience in the mortgage industry. And so we're putting them through our Archwell academies to help them build the skills that they need to be successful, efficient, and effective in their roles. And it's we're not just teaching people, we're helping to create new careers for people that don't have experience. And so when you look at the future of work, and you talk about the skill deficit, I keep telling my team, we're doing it. That's exactly what we're doing because we're creating new opportunities by helping people build those technical skills and power skills that they need. So the answer to the question is, how does it feel? It feels fantastic because I'm in a position where I can apply my 25 years of experience. I can apply everything I've learned in my multiple degrees in a place where we really want to create learning, a learning culture, learning opportunities to build the best infrastructure the best learning system and the best capabilities for our talents amazing and um uh, was there I'm, I'm assuming you would have joined the business if you didn't have the support of the leadership team <laughs> uh as well but i mean was there any pushback at all of you saying actually let's not go the traditional route which we do in finance and insurance and go for these highly educated graduates you know that's the traditional approach um you know, my wife works in a similar industry and um going for the raw talent and kind of building up that way. Was there any pushback from the, t from the leadership team and you know, changing? Uh, that, that was actually not my idea at all. And so I, I owe that to the CEO. I owe it to our board members. That was already their idea. Oh, great. So they had this idea that they wanted to find this talent. They wanted to put them through an academy. They just needed somebody to help execute that vision. So they came to me with that vision already, which is such a, a beautiful place for me to be yeah. in, to not have to try and, convince them of that they're coming to me saying hey this is what we want can you do it and i'm thinking you, is this real like are you You're sure me. this is what you want <laughs> i don't have to fight you for this and and it's the first time i've experienced where learning has a seat at the executive table it's you know it's, it's an actual clo role sitting at the c-suite uh there's no pushback in fact they're pushing me harder which is great i want to be pushed harder and they they this has to work. It has to work for our business model and it has to work for me personally as a, a story and an example of what L and D can do and how powerful it truly can be. Because one of the struggles I've had is in the industry is we talk so much to each other about the same thing and we're all saying what we should be doing, but not many people are in a situation where they actually can do it. And so this is one of those where I can take all the theoretical stuff that we've been talking about for years and actually apply it. 
and have it work. Yeah, which is why I asked you that question. Because I know many CLOs that don't have that, <laughs> which is why, which is why I asked <laughs> in in the first place, and it makes sense why you joined <laughs> the business now um, uh, as well. So that's that's really exciting that you kind of uh, the shackles are off. You know, you just you, really can, you can run at it as well. Um, we spoke about this before, but I'm not sure if something you want to jump into as well. But you know, you didn't have the greatest experience in other companies when you left businesses. To just to pursue new careers, at the time we spoke, those things were pretty fresh. Um, so, is that something you wanted to explore mm -hmm. and talk about? Because I feel like you know, you, we should encourage people to take that next step. It's part of their learning journey, their growth. It's super relevant to our conversation. Uh, even me as a manager for years, yeah. I held back people on my team because it was like, oh, I don't want them to let them leave, them leave because. You know, if they wanted that learning, they wanted that growth. And I was like, no, but I want to keep them <laughs> in my team because they're making me loads of money, literally, uh, in sales. And it was only until I kind of many, many years and a lot more experience down the line, I was like, oh, my job is actually to the opposite <laughs> of yeah. that. And even when people left the business, I was like really excited for you. Congratulations um, as well. It took me a long time to grow into that type of person, leader. So my, my team asked me, my new team asked me, what can we expect of you as a leader? And I said, you can expect that I'm going to help prepare you for your next job because this isn't it. I want you to stay with me as long as you want to stay here, but I also want to know where it is you want to go next so I can help prepare you to get there because this isn't going to be your, your end, end job. Uh, no one has ever said that to me before. In fact, I would say my leadership style is a culmination of everything I wish that I would have had and the opposite of what I did have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, I'm going to offend some people, but it's, it's, the, it's the reality. I don't have a specific leadership model, model I follow. Um, I lead with heart, with empathy, with my experience, and again, everything that I wish that I would have had that I, that I never got. Um, so my experience leaving organizations has not particularly been positive in the fact that it wasn't supported. It felt, it felt like almost like a divorce. Like as soon as you, you make that decision, then you're cut out, you're cut off. And yet you've invested so many years in a relationship together and it, it hurts. You want it to be supportive. You want, and, and I've told my team specifically, uh, I'm going to push you. I believe that we are always learning, growing, that we're never going to stabilize, that we could always be doing better. So just because I'm pushing you to be better doesn't mean that you're bad. It just means that we can always be better. Yeah. And I want to find those opportunities. But if it gets to a point where you don't want to be pushed or you don't want to be on this team, talk to me about it. Tell me. Don't just look for another job and then quit. Let's have that conversation so I can help you manage out. I don't want one day you come in and say, hey, I'm putting in my two weeks notice because I've been miserable. Tell me, hey, I'm miserable. I'd like to move on. Can you help me? Absolutely. But no one has ever, ever done that for me. And I think there's this old adage, and I don't agree with this, but uh, it's something like people quit bosses, not their company. And I think both are true. I think you can quit a company. Uh, you can quit a boss. You can quit your boss and your company. But I think having those conversations where you're, you're creating a safe space for someone to come in and say, I'm not happy. My needs aren't being met. I don't know if this is the right place. I'm thinking about leaving. Uh, can we talk about what that might look like? I think it's going to, it's going to save uh, emotional costs. It's going to save financial costs from quick turnover, having to replace them. Uh, you may be able to find another place for them in, inside your company. So, uh, for me, the, the moral of the story is having those empathetic conversations with your team um, to find the right place for them. Yeah. No, I love the way you put it um, um, as well. And most of my leadership management style was also coming the same way, unfortunately, <laughs> from previous uh, experiences um, uh, as well. But I think you made a really good point. But by having that conversation with your team and setting that tone, you pro like most of the friends and family members that I've spoken to that have quit their jobs, they haven't even ever even spoken to that business or manager about why they did it. 
because they didn't feel that they, they, they had that sort of psych- psychological safety, that environment they could do mm-hmm. as well. So by opening up that, by saying what you did, you you're not even you're probably not even going to get that far. They're probably going to come to you way sooner and say, "This is how I'm feeling." Can we have a conversation before they get to the point of I'm leaving, which is basically what happens to mm-hmm. most companies, right? They find out that the person's leaving because they've given in their resignation, what they had no idea. Oh my God, no idea. So I think a lot of that, they're going to actually stay longer <laughs> Whether because they feel cared for, they feel valued, they have a voice, they can have a conversation and tell you, this is what how I'm feeling as well, right? Um, so I think it's super important. People may have, in the past seen that as oh my god you're giving people permission to leave whereas i think you never had that control in the first place so right. like, you're, <laughs> like, you're fooling yourself <laughs> if you felt that that was the situation so so but by putting it out there it just shows who you are and what you stand for and and it makes people feel cared for and valued and i think that if 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 what i'm saying doesn't make sense and you're thinking I could never go talk to my boss about that. That's your answer right there. You already, you already know what type of relationship that you have. And that's, that's been my experience predominantly is, well, no way would I ever go and tell my boss. Yeah, I'm thinking about now. they'll probably fire me. Mm-hmm. And so it's up, to, it's up to the leader to open that door and create that psychological safety. You know, an employee is not going to randomly just go up and have this conversation. So <laughs> I think, um, you know, that, that's, that's where the leader's responsibility is. And, and one of the other things I did when I joined this team was um, I, on, on day one, introduced them to me and sort of a, my background, but also my leadership expectation in terms of here's what you can expect from me as a leader. You know, you can expect feedback. You can expect honesty, transparency, an open door. I'm going to help you grow. And then here's what I expect from you. And I think that helped to establish that relationship because how many times have you joined a new leader and you thought like, well, what are they about? You don't what get is it, their... yeah. You have like to learn the me, hard I way, have, right? You have to uh, learn the hard way and it's not good for either, either party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like what, like an example is, uh, I have RBF. You know what that is? No. Oh, I do. Oh no! I, I, sorry, I said no, and then I immediately got it. So, 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 so one of my one of my questions I ask on the show to people is, you know, what's a common misconception people have about you? And that one comes up quite a lot. They see they see my face and it. assume that and I'm so, not approachable. Yeah. Yeah. On day one, I, I told the team. I said, "Look, I have RBF. Here's what it is. I can't change the shape of my face." <laughs> It looks like I'm angry. It looks like I'm irritated. I said, don't ever read my face. Just ask me or understand that I will tell you. If I'm upset, I will tell you. You don't need to try and read between the lines or figure out what my face says. And so I think when we, when we are open with our team and and transparent about that, it really helps to break down those walls so that we, we see each other as humans and we create that psychological safety. Yeah. It's so funny. I was chatting to, um, uh, Krispy Kreme's chief HR officer and she said the same thing. And she says what she does now is wear like, she wears like fun (laughs) t-shirts with like funny characters and quotes on. Um, and some of them directly say stuff like that, but she's like, just so people know, even when they just look at me and I've got <laughs> what you just said, um, that, they, that, that, and she addresses it like you, she addresses it with people that she meets mm-hmm. and the teams. And she also said in the same conversation actually uh, as well, that she also shares the fact that she's not gonna be here forever. She doesn't see Krispy Kreme mm-hmm. as a, reti- she's not retire at Krispy Kreme. And she has that, she's super transparent about that. She, she said that during our conversation. It's just so refreshing because it's so true. Why are we trying to avoid it? Like, like, like and pretend that, don't get me wrong. There are company people, you know, I had, you know, Pfizer's chief people officer on the sh- on a LinkedIn live show last week and she's been there 25 years. So maybe she may end her career at Pfizer and have mm-hmm. one company. That's very rare. Um, that that's going to happen um, as well. But listen, before I let you go, we, we, I feel like we, I'm so ha- super happy we, we spent time because I could have asked you all the loads of questions around, you know, the future of learning development and we could have got into specific specifics of the company. But I feel like the story that we've just gone through and your journey and the experience, I feel like that's so much more valuable. So I appreciate you sharing that um, with, with everyone. Yeah. But um, last question I'd say is, you know, what advice would you give for those young um, L&D leaders, even HR leaders, they're on their journey to, to where you are now. 
Um, Give me a second here, because I just wrote an article on this, actually, <laughs> on uh, <laughs> five uh, five best practices for L&D practitioners. Oh, we'll link that in the description um, then, and we'll find that after. I'll link that below <laughs> for, for everyone. Okay. <laughs> uh, what I would say is, uh, first of all, never stop learning for yourself. Um, but research, research, research. Um, we, you know, LinkedIn can be such a valuable tool but it also can just regurgitate the same single thought, the same idea that may not actually be researched or a valid idea. So take the time to critically think for yourself rather than what someone else has said, including me. Don't take what anyone has said as face value. Um, research it and develop your own point of view. And now it's okay if it's aligned with their point of view, but come up with that thought for yourself rather than repeating their thought. Um, learning technology is not the solution for everything. I think that we've got a little bit of a challenge in our industry right now with um, tech being that quick solution. And the reality is the, the foundation of learning, the theory of learning hasn't changed. There are different tools and mechanisms that we have now available to us. So understand learning theories Understand Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. Understand behavioral theory. Look back at, you know, at the research 100 years ago because all of that still matters. We can't just discount it because it's 100 years old. It's all still very valid. So understand learning theories. Understand that uh, te learning technology is an enabler. It is not a solution. Um, give back to the community. Once you have a story because all of us have a different story in our organizations. What worked for me at General Motors may not work for me at Archwell. And so when you have a story, whether it's a success or failure, share it with our industry. Share it at ATD, at CLO, at Training Industry, on LinkedIn, because we're not sharing enough of our practitioner stories. It all still feels like this pretty packaged picture of what it should be. And there aren't a lot of people who are willing to take the risk about what it actually is and how it fails. I love talking about our failures because failure to me stands for first attempt in learning. <laughs> so failure is still a positive data point that we can leverage because it's what didn't work. And we need to be sharing those stories rather than just the Instagram pretty picture of, hey, you know, everything is fantastic. Our LMS and our LXT are great and all of our learners are learning. Well, that's probably not 100% reality. So share the failures along with those successes. Yeah, I'm writing that down. First attempted learning. <laughs> I love that one. Um, well, look, thanks so much for coming on the show. Congratulations again. I'll make sure that I keep calling you doctor for at least another year until you until you get bored, <laughs> until you get bored of it. <laughs> maybe you won't ever get bored of it uh, as well. But maybe you'll be like one of those other doctors that says to me, Chris, don't call me doctor. Maybe there's a, I wonder how many years that takes until you're like, ah, uh, I don't need it anymore. Probably until it's all paid off. Maybe oh, okay. after it's paid off. All right, then. yeah. You're like, yeah, because it's a constant reminder. You're like, yeah. All right, wait until it's paid off yeah. and then we'll see. <laughs> but listen, I'm super, super happy for you, proud of you. And, um, you, you know, it's great when you speak to people that know that they're living their purpose and they're in the right place, in the right seat. So keep up the amazing work. And I look forward to doing this again soon. All right. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks for what you do here, because, uh, you know, you're one of the, the voices of reason that I always recommend to new L&D practitioners. So your question is, what would you recommend? And I would say following this podcast, following your work, because you are talking to people like myself who are actually out there doing it. And you're having real uh, valuable conversations that I think have tangible takeaways that people can apply. So this is one of the best tools, I think. Uh, staying connected to the practitioners who are actually doing the work, not just talking about the work. And that's kind of the difference, I think, in the industry. Is we've got some who'd love to just go out and talk about it, yeah. but then we've got others who are actually doing it, and you focus on those who are actually doing it. So thank you for doing that. No, I, pre no, I appreciate it. And that's the whole reason we started the show in the first place. So I appreciate it. Well, look, enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you again soon. Thanks. All right, thanks.